Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for session two of our webinar titled Remote Sensing for Conservation and Biodiversity. My name is Amber McCollum and I'll be your instructor today. For this course, we will have two one hour sessions on January 22nd and January 24th. We offer the webinar at two different times to reach a broader international audience once at 10 a.m. Eastern Time and another time at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The sessions are offered on the same day. The sessions that are offered on the same day are the same. So you only need to attend one per day. All the materials can be found on the course website listed here. And if you have any questions following the lectures, you can email myself or my colleague Cindy Schmidt at our email addresses shown here. Again, as a reminder, in order to receive a certificate of completion, you must have attended both live webinars and you also need to complete the homework by February 7th. The homework can be um, accessed via the via Google Forms on from the link on our website. You'll receive the certificate of completion about two months after the completion of the course. Again, we only have one prerequisite for this course, and that is our fundamentals of remote sensing or equivalent knowledge. For this course, you will need to access the course materials via this FTP website shown here. This is a little different than what we've done for past RSET webinars, where all the materials have been located on the RSET website. So as you can see here, you'll be able to download the um, PDFs of the sessions and find the link to the homework um, via this FTP website here. For this course, we have two sessions. Um, on Tuesday, Cindy Schmidt presented remote sensing for conservation. And then today, I will be presenting remote sensing for biodiversity. The agenda for today first includes an overview of global bio biodiversity. Then I will give you information about the Group of Earth Observations, or GEO, and the GEO Biodiversity Observation Network, or GEOBON. Within GEOBON, there are regional and thematic bonds, including marine bond. I will also discuss bond in a box and essential biodiversity variables. Finally, I'll give you um, information about a few of the um, currently funded geobond and marine bond projects. So first, we'll begin with just a general overview of global biodiversity. Biodiversity is extremely important to all of us because it supports the functioning of ecosystems, human economies, and public health. Unfortunately, we are losing global biodiversity at an alarming rate. Several papers, um, such as those listed here, indicate 11,000 to 58,000 species are being lost annually. That current rates of extinction are about a thousand times the background rate. And that there has been an overall decline of 60% in population sizes of vertebrates between 1970 and 2014. There are several different organizations dedicated to monitoring global biodiversity, including some of those listed here. The Convention on Biological Diversity, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, and the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network. So now I'll give you a little bit more information about each of those organizations and how they're connected. The Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, was established in 1993 after 150 government leaders signed the convention at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. It recognized the importance of maintaining global biodiversity for food security, medicines, fresh air and water, shelter, and a clean and healthy environment. The objectives of CBD are to conserve biological diversity, sustainably use the components of biological diversity, 
and ensure fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the use of these resources. The CBD strategic plan for 2011 to 2020 has developed an overarching framework on biodiversity, which includes the IHE biodiversity targets, which are a set of 20 global targets organized under five strategic goals. The National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plan is the method for member countries to report on how they are reaching those targets. More information on CBD can be found at the website shown here at the bottom of the slide. The IPBES established in 2012 is an intergovernmental body which assesses the state of biodiversity and of the ecosystem services it provides to society in response to requests from decision makers. It's placed under the umbrella of four United Nations entities, UNEP, UNESCO, FAO, and UNDP. And it's administered by UNEP. Currently, there are 128 member states. Work is grouped into four areas, assessments on specific themes and methodological issues, policy support, building capacity and knowledge, and communications and outreach. The IPBS publishes a number of assessments, including regional assessments on biodiversity and ecosystem services. More information, again, um, for this group can be found at the website listed below. The Global Biodiversity Information Facility allows anyone anywhere to access data about all types of life on Earth. And those data are shared via its global platform. And that platform is listed here, uh, gbif.org. They also have national and thematic portals that can be accessed through this website. This helps institutions to publish data using common standard standards and operates through a network of nodes, which um, really facilitates international cooperation and collaboration. The IUCN, established in 1948, is the world's largest and most diverse environmental network. Its more than 1,300 members include states, government agencies, NGOs, and indigenous peoples organizations. This also includes over 13,000 international experts. It assesses the status of the natural world and the measures that are needed to protect it. It has developed important information about global conservation status of threatened species and ecosystems. The red list of threatened species and ecosystems are derived using a set of criteria to evaluate uh, extinction risk. The World Database of Key Biodiversity Areas, or KBAs, hosted by BirdLife International, includes data on global and regional key biodiversity areas. Um, and this also includes important bird habitats. The criteria for identifying KBAs are defined by the IUCN global standard for the identification of key biodiversity areas. And this criteria is clustered into five categories. And it, these categories include threatened biodiversity, geographically restricted biodiversity, ecological integrity, biological processes, and re irreplaceability. Again, we've listed the website here for more information and access to these data. So next I'll be giving you some information about how satellite observations are being used for biodiversity monitoring and assessment through GeoBond. The Group on Earth Observations, or GEO, is an inter intergovernmental organization working to improve the availability access and use of earth observations in eight societal, societal benefit areas. And those benefit areas are listed here. And these include biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability, disaster resilience, energy and mineral resource management, food security and sustainable agriculture, public health surveillance, sustainable urban development, 
infrastructure and transportation management, and water resource management. It supports the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Paris Climate Agreement, Agreement the Sendai Framework, and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. It currently has 105 member countries and 127 participating organizations. So it's a really large um, overarching group. The Geobiodiversity Observation Network represents the biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability societal benefit area um, from those that I mentioned in the previous slide. It's based on the CBD strategic plan for 2011 to 2020 that I also mentioned earlier. It states that by 2050, biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and widely used, maintaining ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy planet, and delivering benefits essential for all people. So Geobon was developed to really coordinate uh, large scale biodiversity monitoring and to meet these goals that are outlined um, under the CBD. The mission of Geobon is to improve the acquisition, coordination, and delivery of biodiversity observations um, and really relate that to the services and the users and how to effectively disseminate that information. This um, aims to be accomplished through the development of a global biodiversity observation network. So this network really integrates the data sets, the models and projections, and the results from the information that would be useful to these decision makers. Um, also helpful for resource managers, governments, NGOs and other scientists. So GeoBond um, you know, is this very large organization and it's really a network of networks. In other words, it integrates regional and global networks and many of those are listed on this slide here. So it really emphasizes the openness and collaboration amongst many of these groups in order to, to achieve these uh, really large overarching goals. The two pillars of GeoBon include developing a standard and flexible framework for biodiversity observations and supporting the development of biodiversity networks. So the intent here really is to produce policy relevant outputs that can be used by decision makers. So this is kind of what we've been discussing in many of these slides is the, the end goal. There are several, several different elements under GeoBond. Currently, there are three national bonds, including those in China, Colombia, and France. There are also two regional bonds, including the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program, or the Arctic Bond, and the Asia Pacific Bond. And then we have two thematic bonds, uh, the Marine Bond, or M Bond, and the Freshwater Bond, or F Bond. Bond in a Box is an online toolkit for facilitating the startup and enhancement of these national and regional bonds. Currently, the Humboldt Institute in Colombia has developed a regional pilot version of this Bond in a Box. So I'll be discussing some of these uh, projects shortly. The other important element of GeoBond are the essential biodiversity variables, or EBVs. EBVs are modeled after the essential climate variables that guide the implementation of the global climate observing system. EBVs have been developed to derive biodiversity indicators for the Akai biodiversity targets. EBVs are a minimum set of measurements that are complementary to one another and can capture major dimensions of biodiversity change. They must be biologically and policy relevant, sensitive to change, characterize biological and state variables, generalizable across space, and they must be scalable and feasible. So there are EBV working groups that um, develop these variables to fit within that larger geobond framework. 
So the EBVs are really um, divided up into these two different groups of classes. We have the species focused EBV classes and then the ecosystem focused classes. And so underneath these two different groups, there are areas of concern. So for example, here you can see that under the species focused classes, there's genetic composition, species populations, and species traits. And then um, here on the right, we have under the ecosystem classes, we have things like community composition, ecosystem structure, and ecosystem function. So underneath each of these specific variables, uh, there are specific variables in each of these classes. So for example, we have some of these listed here. For um, the variables measured for species traits are things like phenology and body mass. And similarly, for the ecosystem EBBs, um, under e ecosystem function, the variables measured may be nutrient retention or net primary productivity. So there's all these um, sets of variables that are included um, within these um, different groups. And what we're really concerned with here in this training um, and at NASA is how satellite Earth observations can be used. Um, and here we've sort of highlighted the two areas, ecosystem function and ecosystem structure, where um, NASA satellite Earth observations can contribute to um, these variables. No single data set can provide a comprehensive overview of biodiversity states and changes. But the integration of multiple data sets can provide, hopefully, provide policy relevant information. So here you can see that the biodiversity observations feed into the EBVs, and those EBVs are an effective way to explain changes in biodiversity, which can be clearly articulated in assessments uh, and strategic plans. And these are the, the documents that are being read and used by the policymakers. The EBV data portal is currently being developed to combine all of the relevant information for the EBVs. It's still a work in progress, but when it's fully functional, you'll be able to locate, visualize, and summary, summarize the EBV information for regions or countries. And so we've included the website listed here for you all to take a look at um, what's currently developed under the, the GeoBunt portal. A project that's being led by Walter Yetz at Yale University is using an existing web-based platform, the Map of Life, to support species distributions and species abundance EBVs. The Map of Life will include inventory data sets such as photos from camera traps and plant plot survey data. It will improve upon existing modeling methods for assessing population change using remote sensing data. So it proposes to deliver a range of EVV products for select birds and mammals in North America, flowering plants in South Africa, and select terrestrial vertebrates globally. So this is um, actually a tool that we've mentioned in some of our previous webinars, um, and it's, it's a really great place to go um, take a look at as well. So last year, NASA's Applied Sciences Program funded several projects focused on using, using and developing tools and products for Geobon. Three of these projects are in Colombia, the location of one of the regional bonds that we mentioned earlier. The projects were all required to incorporate satellite remote sensing data into their tools and projects, products. So I'm going to give you a little um, short overview of some of these projects. And then um, I also wanted to mention that these projects have just started. So the tools and products uh, that we'll be speaking about here may not be fully developed yet, but in a few years after these tools are developed, we're, we aim to work with the project scientists to conduct webinars on these tools. So stay tuned for, for those.
The first of these projects aims to support biodiversity change indicator calculations. A new software called Wallace is being improved upon. This is an open source modular R-based platform for species distribution modeling. This project led by Mary Blair at the American Museum of Natural History will expand Wallace by developing two new R packages and allow Wallace to be used um, as a bond in the box that we mentioned earlier. The project will also connect Wallace with Biomodelos, an existing Colombian bond web application. So they also aim to develop training materials and user guides in both English and Spanish. The EVV that this project is addressing is species distribution, and it, it will accomplish two things. The new R packages will match in situ observations of species occurrence to remote sensing products, such as those available um, via MODIS. This will result in refined species distribution model predictions and could also be used to estimate the current range of species. The new R packages will also aggregate distribution model predictions for individual species to calculate biodiversity change indicators, including things like extent of occurrence, percent suitable land cover, mean human footprint, and protected area coverage. The second product, project, led by Victor Gutierrez Velez at Temple University, is also developing an R package to conduct change assessment in Colombia. They're really focused on four ecosystems, paramos, wetlands, savannas, and lowland forests. They will be using several different satellite-derived products listed in the table here shown on the right. These tools will help identify priority areas for conservation and strengthen the bond in Colombia. The third Colombian project will be using LIDAR and eventually JEDI imagery or the Global Ecosystem Dynamic Investigation to quantify vertical forest structure. JEDI was launched um, recently, December 5th, 2018, and it will reside on the International Space Station for approximately two years. It has a 25 meter spatial resolution and allows mapping of forest canopy heights, canopy three-dimensional structure, above ground biomass and surface topography. The first data should be released and available to the public in about five to six months. So next I will discuss um, marine bond and give you some examples of the projects that NASA has funded under this specific topic area. Marine bond or M bond was established in 2016 to use the EBV concept in the marine realm. The goal of MBON is to coordinate, promote, and augment the capabilities of present and future national and international observing systems to characterize and monitor diversity of marine life at the genetic, species, and ecosystem levels. And they aim to use a broad array of in situ and remote sensing observations to do this. Using EBVs as a model, they've defined essential ocean variables, or EOVs. There are three um, current US MBON projects the Arctic, the Santa Barbara Channels, and sanctuaries in the Florida Keys and Monterey Bay and the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, which is um, located in the Gulf of Mexico. There are two global MBON projects, the Pole to Pole and Dynamic Seascapes projects, and uh, I'll discuss those in the next few slides as well. The EOVs are developed through the Global Ocean Observing System. MBON is collaborating with with the Global Ocean Observing System, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, and the Integrated Marine Biosphere Research Project to really ensure that the EBVs and the EOVs are complementary. 
For more information um, about those organizations, you can um, take a look at the websites that we've listed here as well. So finally, um, I am going to describe two of the MBON, MBON projects that NASA has funded, the Pole to Pole MBON and Dynamic Seascapes. And again, just as a reminder, um, in, similarly to the GeoBond projects, these projects have just gotten um, started. So their products and tools are not yet fully developed, but stay tuned for webinars on these MBON projects. The Pole to Pole MBON project, led by Dr. Enrique Montes at the University of South Florida, is focused on integrating biological and environmental data, including satellite remote sensing, for countries along the Pacific and Atlantic coasts of the Americas. This is a network of cooperating research institutions, marine laboratories, parks, and reserves. They will be developing and documenting best practices associated with marine biodiversity and observations. They will be conducting trainings and developing user guides about how to integrate these data in a way that's consistent and repeatable across the region. Dr. Maria Cavanaugh at Oregon State University is developing a biogeographic framework to characterize the variability of ocean dynamics in time and space. And this is called dynamic seascapes. It will serve as the basis for scaling local observations of biodiversity to regional responses and climate. Results include global ski safe, ski seascape classification schemes using ocean color, winds, temperature, sea surface height, and sea ice from satellite imagery. Seascapes have been classified for the Florida Keys and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries. The map here on the right shows an example of dynamic seascape classification in the Monterey Bay region for a specific day of the year. Notice here that the day of the year is um, 004, and that's listed in Julian days, so January 4th. And then this image shows how the seascape changes throughout the year. And notice now that we are in day 108 or April 17th. This will provide data on the changing dynamics of the ocean and how it may relate to species distributions in the region. Within the sanctuaries, these maps have been produced at one kilometer resolution and eight day time steps. So now you can see um, here the ocean dynamics have changed in a really short period of time um, from April 17th, where the last image was showing, to May 11th. Maps for the larger eco regions uh, will be produced at um, four kilometer resolutions on monthly time steps. These maps uh, will represent mean conditions over several years. So conditions at any given point in time may be slightly different. So in summary, there are many important international organizations focused on monitoring and preserving biodiversity, including the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, the IUCN, and GeoBond. So the importance of GeoBond is that it's specifically using satellite remote sensing to measure these EBVs. And there are several projects focused on incorporating remote sensing derived EBVs into the regional bonds, um, such as those examples from Colombia that we um, talked about earlier. One of the thematic bonds, such as the projects under marine bonds, are also um, incorporating satellite remote sensing and um, doing a lot of coordination across existing networks. So as I mentioned before, the purpose of this webinar was really to introduce you to those programs and projects with the intent to offer um, more in-depth webinars on specific tools in the future. Um, so um, please stay tuned for that and um, feel free to share with us in the, the question box which uh, projects or tools you might um, be specifically interested in for a future webinar. 
Um, I know we presented a lot of really good options here, um, but the more information we have about what you all want to see, um, we can place priority on um, doing those types of webinars. So we will have time for a short question and answer session, but um, I wanted to again provide our contact information for myself and my colleague Cindy Schmidt. Um, if you have any questions about the land management and wildfire trainings after um, this session, you can also um, contact Anna Prados, who is our program manager for general RSET um, questions, and then. We've also just listed the standard RSET website here where you can find um, all of the information about this training and um, trainings in other application areas that may be of interest to you as well. So I'd like to thank you all for attending today. And um, just a reminder, since this is the second session, um, the homework will be due in two weeks on February 7th. And then you can access the link to um, the homework on, on our course website. And all you need to do is complete that in Google Forms and submit it, and um, we will take record of that as well. All right, everyone. Um, well, we're going to, while we have a little time today, um, we're going to do some uh, demonstrations of a few of the websites that we mentioned throughout today's webinar. So if you just bear with us for a moment, I'm going to switch the screen over to um, share my screen and um, show you some of these websites. And again, um, as Cindy mentioned on Tuesday, um, we just want to recognize all of the folks from across the world who are on today. Um, we have over 560 attendees today, so thank you all for being here. Um, so what I wanted to do now was just take you through a few of those websites that we mentioned and show some of the um, features um, that you can use and access, and then we'll get to um, some of the, the questions. So the first one I thought I'd show is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, and here you can, um, this is the, their main website that we have on the presentation. You can see some um, news articles about um, what this, this data network has done. Um, and you can also uh, learn a little bit more about what they, who they are and what they do. Um, so this, this is that international network of um, research infrastructure, and um, you can really share your species data um, here online, um, and they draw on a lot of different networks. Um, there's also some information here about the Darwin Core Standard, and if you go to this site, you can um, get more information about how you can participate in the um, archive. Um, so if you follow the standard in um, your species data, you can um, actually uh, contribute to um, this information. So there's, there's information here about how to get started and integrating your data through this global network. Um, additionally, um, you can search for species here and get some uh, information right off the bat. So I wanted to just show you um, one of my favorite uh, animals is the snowy plover. Um, they, we see them a lot of times out here on the beach. So you can use um, common names or you can use scientific names. And then what happens here is this species comes up and we can click on it and get more information about each species um, via the archive that has been provided. So you can see some images here. Um, you can see where they're occurring. Um, you can look at the map um, at uh, different time periods of um, sampling. Um, and then you can um, look at all of the data sets that have this species um, in that data set. So it's really nice, um, quick and easy way to sort of start to get some of this information. You can also do things like look at the metrics. Um, so you can look at things like occurrences per month. Um, you can look at um, country data. Um, you can look at how the species occurrence has changed over time um, and various things here.
You can also um, access some various tools via this website here. I know that um, on Tuesday we had some questions about Maxent, which is um, a um, really uh, popular software for um, species um, distribution modeling. So you can get more information here about that and you can also um, download the software and um, get more information there. You can also go to the tools catalog on this website and find many different tools that you could use. So I know there's been a lot of questions of, you know, what tools do I use? Where do I go? Um, this may be a great place for you guys to start. Um, so I wanted to show you first some of the features of this really great website here. The second website I wanted to mention is our um, group on Earth observations. Um, so here's this website. Again, um, you can get a lot of information about um, what GEO is. You know, it's this really large network of organizations who are trying to make Earth observations more accessible globally. Um, and so you can learn a little bit about, um, about the, a little bit more about the group here. Um, you can also do things like explore by topic. So you could look up specifically biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability and have some more information here about the related programs, um, particularly GeoBond. So this is, uh, was a main focus of the webinar today. And um, again, if you're interested in, in this, you can come here and, and learn more about it here, um, in particular, the Bond in a Box and the EBV toolkits. You can also learn about regional initiatives. Um, so one of um, the popular regional initiatives is AmeriGeos, and that's focused on um, the geo members of the American continent, and um, you can learn a little bit more about the, the projects there. You can also learn about capacity building. And I really like this part of the website because it has these great resources for you all. Um, some of these data catalogs and portals, um, such as Severe, which is our um, sister organization that has um, global hubs um, in certain locations that work with government and local organizations to create tools um, to answer some of these questions that you may have. And there's also some other training courses and tutorials here. So that's a really great website. Also, I wanted to show you Geobon. So the Geobon website is here, um, and this has a lot more specific information, particularly pertaining to the types of things we showed you today. Um, so you can learn about the different biodiversity observation networks in different regions, um, and learn about what this group is doing here. Again, you know, there's a lot of information here that we don't need to go through, but you can learn about the regional bonds, um, thematic bonds, <clears throat> such as the M bond that we mentioned here. You can also go to Bond in a Box, um, which is this website here that we mentioned. So this is this regionally customizable toolkit for facilitating starting with these projects, right? So you can use a uh, bond in a box to identify different tool sets that might be useful to you. Um, so just going through here, well, we could show you what the um, bond in a box website looks like. First off, they just have some general information. Um, you can contact them, you can search for tools um, based on a variety of filters. So if we just um, scroll down here, for example, you can search for different tools for biodiversity, ecosystem services, sustainability, um, and you can filter them based on what you're interested in. So um, you can filter them based on um, the essential biodiversity, um, the EBVs that you are interested in. You can do by theme, by kind. So for example, if we just do by kind and look at software, you can scroll through um, a variety of different tools that, that might be useful to you. And one of those um, might be the NatureServe Biodiversity Indicators Dashboard. 
So if you click on that, you can get a just a brief overview of what that dashboard includes. And then there's the website here if you um, want to go there for, for more information. And then also here, um, you can go to the EBV portal, which is another um, data portal that we mentioned during our presentation today. And when you click on this portal here, you're taken to um, what I believe is still in development, um, but the, the portal here allows you to look at uh, a few different metrics. Um, you can look at things like changes in average local terrestrial diversity, changes in bird diversity, and forest cover, which has some of the same information as um, Global Forest Watch, if you all are familiar with that. So for example, if we just take a look at changes in average um, uh, terrestrial diversity, we can get a short description here. And then we can look at different metrics, uh, like alpha diversity relative to pristine baseline, or relative to changes in local species rich richness from 1900. So if we just click on that, then the um, website should load. And I might be able to make this smaller zoom out a little bit, you should be able to see the legend here um, where we show where green essentially is increase and red is decrease in, um, in these metrics. You can also look at things like the um, changes in the bird diversity and the metrics here are um, global species ri richness trend for all birds um, as a mean, for forest birds in particular, and then the global species. I think that these are the same here. Again, I think that they are working to develop these and, and improve them. But if we just take a look at the global species ri richness for all birds, we see um, globally um, a lot of increases, a lot of green. Um, and what we can also do is look at specific countries of interest. So if we come down here and um, we maybe we're interested in Brazil, for example, we can find Brazil, we can change the timeline. Um, let's just look from 1900 to 1912 or to 2012. Well, maybe we'll go to 2015. And then you can go to calculate and it'll show you just a really quick and dirty um, graph of um, sort of what's happening with the global species rich, richness in Brazil. And this is for local birds. So we can see um, over the years, there's been a slight increase from 1990 to 2015. Um, and then, but if we look at, for example, forest birds, we see some different patterns happening. So here in Brazil, again, um, we'll do the same time period. We'll also do some for the plot options and we'll calculate again. And what we're seeing now is a decrease in the forest birds from 1990, um, along with um, presumably deforestation. So again, this is a nice um, toolbox we can come to. We can do a time slider up here. We can. Um, analyze the map, and I believe they'll be adding um, things and, and modifying this as the um, Geobon um, projects continue. Um, and, and we do have a little bit of time. So the last one I wanted to just briefly show you that's really great <clears throat> that we may or may not have a, a more in-depth webinar about is Map of Life. And we mentioned this in one of the slides. Um, but I was playing around with this yesterday and it has so many cool features. Um, so you can do things like map species, you view their range, inventory, occurrence data. Um, you can view species by location or you can look at things like patterns um, and some of these indicators. So for example, if we just go here to map species, uh, we could select from one of their favorites or you can look at different groups vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, or we can search for a species here. Let's just use one of theirs. Um, their tiger striped leaf frog. 
Um, and so what you're seeing here automatically is um, are the locations, the range of that species, um, where, where they find it occurring um, on the map. So you can play around with that a little bit as well. Um, you can look at different locations. <clears throat> so you can filter by political boundaries, or you can look at mountain ranges. So um, for example, if we're interested in um, species on Madagascar, we can type that in here. And you could see um, you know, all of the metrics. So they have um, 500 and, or 245 birds, 300 and, uh, 236 mammals. And you can click on here and learn about all of the species that have been identified in this region. Um, or you could filter based on your interests. And if we go back um, to locations again, you can also um, search by global mountain ranges, which is very cool. Um, so if you come around here, for example, um, one of the mountain ranges that I'm really interested in with some of my work are the Chuska Mountains um, located on the Navajo Nation um, in the states of Arizona and New Mexico. So you can click on one of these outlined mountain ranges, get a description of it, and then you can find the species that are located there. Um, so you can do sort of the same thing that you did on a countrywide basis, but for um, mountain regions as well. You can also look at um, different indicators, such as um, species data coverage. So you can sort of explore these trends of assemblage level and species level. Um, you can look at different species groups. And you can hover over um, a country and look at the percent area coverage of different types of species, which is really cool. And, and finally, um, some of the patterns you can look at. Um, these are in beta. So um, clearly, when you come to the website, you'll see there's a lot of features that they're working on but the species richness and biodiversity facets. Um, so there's a lot to see here. I believe you can um, register for free and create an account and um, potentially save some of the um, data and information that you're interested in. And I know that you can download a lot of the um, species data and patterns um, from this website as well. So since we had a little extra time, I just wanted to highlight some of those as well. And um, so now what we'll do here is we'll just come back um, and we'll go to some of the questions. Um, so just checking to make sure um, everything's going all right. And we have about 10 more minutes for, for questions. So we will um, just switch back on over. And um, so hopefully you all can now see, uh, we have this, um, like we did on Tuesday, we have this question and answer um, document, which once we've um, sort of edited it and gone through um, a lot of these, we'll post them online. Um, I also just wanted to mention, we have all of the um, PowerPoints and um, available on the FTP site that, that you've seen. and. Um, we'll have the recordings up soon for, for those um, that want to rewatch anything or that couldn't attend today. So for some of these questions, um, as they were coming in, we um, were able to already answer some of them and actually look up a lot of the websites, which is, is what we tend to do a lot of the times where we're asked some of these questions. So um, there were a lot of questions about um, Jedi and um, obtaining that, that new LIDAR data. And um, these are the data that uh, it, it, the sensor was launched in December, and it's hosted on the International Space Station. And um, it's slated to be around for two years. And right now, um, the, the data are not quite available yet, as far as I understand it, um, but they'll be available soon. And this really just depends on which products that you're interested in. So 
here the the first question was where can I find Jedi products and are they available to download and so um, they should be available within the next couple of months um, some products will be available sooner than others just depending on the level of processing that um, that they're going through um, so I've listed the website here where you can find uh, more information about um, Jedi and how to download the data. And um, once the products are available, they'll be um, accessible via the LPDAC website that is also shown here um, for the level one and two data. And then for the higher level products, so these are the, the products that have um, undergone more processing and are uh, probably easier to use for, for those of you that are not very familiar with remote sensing. Um, those will be available um, um, here on the um, Ornel deck here with this website shown. So the second question we have here is how species distribution models and habitat suitability models work with climate and environmental variables in R. So we did, I do think this question came before we mentioned some of the new tools that will be developed um, via R and um, with the, the Wallace package. But the, the idea here really is to combine that species occurrence data with environmental variables. And so as we mentioned, the remote sensing is, is really powerful in terms of identifying environmental variables that um, are um, indicative of certain species and um, can tell us some information about the habitat of the species, right? We're not going to be able to identify specific species there, but we'll maybe be able to identify um, vegetation health or um, temperature patterns or things like that. So there are some tools out there already developed in R, um, and a lot of them combine um, environmental variables from world climb, um, but you can also um, think about incorporating your own remote sensing data layers. So I've listed some websites here. Um, again, I just wanted to mention, and Cindy mentioned this last uh, on Tuesday, but if there are certain trainings or um, certain projects that we've talked about that you are really interested in and would like um, a, a, an advanced in-depth training about them later on, please let us know. Um, and please let us know which projects are really kind of sparking your interest. Um, we've gotten a lot of interest about JEDI, and so we're thinking about maybe doing a, a LIDAR training in the future as well. So that's definitely something that's on our radar. Um, but anyway, getting back to this question, I've listed the website for Wallace, which is the software that was mentioned um, for one of the um, Chiobon projects. And I've also listed a couple other um, websites this first one is great. It's a, it's a GitHub website, but it has um, a lot of information about getting started with um, doing species distribution modeling in R. So check those out. Okay. So question three asks, is the LiDAR available online? Is it free and open software? So again, I think this is in reference to the JEDI data. Um, if not, um, you can follow up with, um, by emailing myself or my colleague Cindy Schmidt um, for more information. But so I think I've, I've sort of answered that question um, with the first answer. And Amber, I'm, I'm gonna add one thing here. Hi everyone, this is Cindy. Um, I do wanna add that um, I know there's a lot of interest in JEDI, um, and especially for uh, the application of forest structure. And um, the plan, our, our set plan is to have a, probably an advanced webinar. We may start with an overview webinar and then follow up with an advanced webinar, specifically on the use of JEDI data for looking at forest structure. And this will be, the guest speaker for that will be one of the, um, P lead people on the science team for JEDI. Um, and he's the one working on the project in Columbia as well. So definitely stay tuned for that. It's all in the beginning stages right now. So we don't have, unfortunately we don't have a lot of um, 
answers for you. But as those products and the methodology becomes developed, we plan to offer more trainings in the future on that. Um, so I just wanted to add that, Amber. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, and then we had another question about, about JEDI, um, when the products will be available. Um, the next question, question five, would like to see an example of Bond in a Box when available using a terrestrial example. And when will Bond in a Box be functional? Um, well, thank you for that uh, feedback. Um, that's definitely something uh, we would take into consideration with developing new trainings, as Cindy mentioned. And I'm not sure when, um, you know, in, in terms of in terms of the bond in the box being useful for uh, identifying different software and tools uh, that you can use, um, that if that's functional currently, um, I'm not sure what the timeline is for any updates or additions to bond in a, in a box. So I have to get back to you on that one, or if Cindy, if you know any more information about that. Um, yeah, I'll just in. add, sure, I'll add a little information on that. So Bond in a Box is a work in progress for sure. So these projects that are going on in Colombia, Colombia has been kind of the um, test bed for developing these tools for Bond in a Box. Um, and so those projects that we presented to you today, we actually presented them on purpose so we could show you what was being developed um, specifically for Bond in the Box. So the the addition of um, the Wallace software and R um, and those kinds of projects will all go into Columbia's Bond in a Box. Um, and other tools are being developed as we speak. So it's all under, you know, it's all under development right now. So just keep Keep an eye on the website as tools are being developed. We will plan, try to plan to have webinars that will describe what those tools are and, and how to use them. Um, the way to think about this webinar series that we're doing, um, that we you know did on Tuesday and followed up today, is that these are very much overview and awareness webinars on you know, what's out there, what's being developed, um, and as they become developed, then we will have follow-up webinars. Great, thank you, Cindy. Um, so the next question, question six, uh, will countries who join GEO get higher resolution updated data if these countries? Um, so I think the idea there with GEO is, is more of um, organization and open access to data and information about where to find these types of data sets um, and really getting the data out to the public. Um, I'm not sure if there are agreements with private organizations that may have um, higher resolution data, um, but in terms of NASA and, um, and I believe most of um, ESA's data, those are all already free and available. Um, and so I think it's really, really about um, collaboration amongst countries and working together to um, share um, data. Okay, and so the next question, question seven, um, that's a pretty specific one. Are there any EBVs for arthropods? Um, I would have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> um, that is not my, my area. Um, I don't know, if Cindy, if you have any other uh, advice on this one. Um, but that's definitely something we can look into and do some research and get back to you on. Right. I would, um, you know, we gave you the the resource for looking at what all the EBVs are um, currently anyway. And they're also, by the way, under development. There's a lot of um, changes going on with EBVs. Um, they tend to be, you know, the purpose of EBVs is, is to make them um, more generalizable across large areas. Um, and so they don't always uh, focus on specific species um, unless there's some similar characteristics with 
um, well, and that's not a specific, that's broader than a specific species, but unless that um, group of um, animals has a common environmental characteristic um, with other animals. Um, so, so they're really essential biodiversity variables are just variables that are important across a lot of area, time and space. That's the way to sort of think of them. So to look at specific EV, EBVs, you'll just have to go, you know, you could go to the website that we listed and it gives you all the EBVs are there. And some of those may be very important to arthropods, but, um, but, but I don't know. Great, thank you, Cindy. Well, we are approaching the um, the hour here, and I know we do have a few more questions. Um, maybe we will look into a couple more. Um, the next question is, I'd be more interested in Geobond EBVs for forest ecosystem services. How can they be measured in data scarce regions? Um, that's a really great question, and that's another one that Cindy may or may not have more information on. Um, yeah, th there's actually a, um, a really interesting project going on with um, EBVs in Costa Rica fo for focused on um, ecosystem services, forest ecosystem services. And again, it's one of those projects that's um, just got started. And so they don't have any results yet. So um, I think another one of our webinars in the future will be fo focused on ecosystem services. So um, you'll have to kind of stay tuned for that one. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so I think um, now that we've, we've approached the, the hour mark, um, I just wanna thank you all again for, for being with us. Um, this is this webinar has been really highly attended. Um, so we thank you all um, for your interest. And again, you know, as we've mentioned um, multiple times today, um, you know, keep uh, keep a lookout for updating or for upcoming webinars in which we will go more in depth with a lot of these things. I know um, this was just meant to um, sort of provide you with information about what's going on in the landscape. And there's a lot of projects and a lot of interest um, in these types of things. And so um, we're, we definitely wanna follow up with more in-depth information after these projects have um, successfully completed some of their objectives and created these tools and the tools are being, um, being used in, in the community. Um, so again, if you will, we'll, um, go through the rest of these questions and type in our answers and then the um, Q&A document will be available on the, the FTP site for you all to view at a later date, um, as well as the recordings and all the materials are already there. And um, just a note too, to complete the homework in two weeks, um, by February 7th, if you would like to receive a certificate of completion and if, if you've attended both live webinars, and um, if you want to follow up with myself or uh, my colleague, Cindy Schmidt, with more in-depth questions, um, please do so. Um, so thank you all and have a good day.